Well, welcome to the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. I'm Alan Hall, along with my co-host in Denmark this week, Joel Saxon. Well, we're here at Wind Europe 2023 in Copenhagen. Uh, so it is the, if you're an American listener, it is like ACP, um, but it is the uh, the yearly one here in Copenhagen. Next year it'll be in the Basque country, kind of bounces around. But uh, yeah, it hasn't rained on us yet here today. So no, I know it's been really sunny the weather's Copenhagen. Been good. Yeah, the weather, the weather has been good. Uh, we took a tour of downtown Copenhagen yesterday. Very right. exciting. A lot to see there. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, if the list, if you're a regular listener, you heard us kind of engage after we were in Hamburg about how that show was. Uh, if you remember correctly, that show was bonkers. It was it was so busy. There was uh, it was so large. Uh, so many people going around. This one. Beautifully done, not quite as big, uh, but still fairly busy. I mean, we've had, uh, we're here with the, you know, we got the Weather Guard booth, we have the Wind Power Lab booth, the Ping booth. We're all kind of in the same area, some of the friends we have, and and uh, we're, we've are we all been busy. We've had a steady stream of people interested in what we're offering all day long, and some even people talking about the Uptime Podcast, maybe even a picture. Yeah. Quasi famous. That's right. Walk around the show today, Joel, and we were here yesterday taking a look around as all the booths were getting set up. The main emphasis in Copenhagen is offshore wind. Yeah. yeah. That's uh, onshore wind, like, doesn't even really exist on yeah. some level. As you fly in, right, like uh, if you're coming to the airport, there's offshore wind turbines right there. So if you're coming over from the U.S. or somewhere else that uh, you don't normally see offshore wind turbines, you get to see some. Uh, as I flew in on uh, Sunday afternoon, they were spinning like crazy. So good to see that. Um, but yeah, so that, I mean, we're here in Denmark, right? So you have uh, Germany um, and going in towards the Baltic Sea and then the North Sea. Uh, there's a lot of Dutch companies here. So uh, a lot of offshore wind uh, focus at this show, definitely. There's a lot of vessel companies. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of uh, subsea service companies. Um, so cool to see that we don't normally see in the U.S. for sure. Well, I, I think one of the, the big takeaways for me is, is that big, heavy industry in, in wind, particularly offshore, is happening here in Europe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there, there's absolutely. almost no American presence. Yeah, I mean, we, we joked about uh, we're, we're sitting here right now. If you got you, of course, you can hear this in the background, but the Polish pavilion is right behind <laughs> us um, playing saxophones and, and having a good old time. But there's the Polish pavilion. There's the Basque country pavilion. There's a French pavilion, a Dutch pavilion, the Danish pavilion, of course. Uh, but there is no large American presence. Um, it's actually even kind of rare to be walking around and run into someone with an American accent. Yeah, it's true. Right? Um, so, and you could pick them out, see when someone with a ball cap on and definitely from the U.S. Um, but um, yeah, the, you would think that we would have an American uh, pavilion here. But of course, like we kind of always say on the podcast, we don't have a whole lot of aftermarket or, uh, you know, we don't, of course, GE is an OEM, but GE is mostly on this side of the pond when it comes to yeah, it is, yeah. um, their offices and, and uh, create their OEM style stuff for a win. But we don't have the companies, so we don't have the, the large presence here either. Yeah. And one of the, um, you know, what happens there is I think American companies are missing out on some of the technology that yeah. is and just even walking around a part of the exhibit, you learn about ropes, you learn about change, you learn about foundations, you learn about yeah. uh, all kinds of underwater apparatus. Oh, cable companies. That's cable companies, cool. yeah. yeah. And, and, I, and this is the place. So yeah. even if you're an American company just trying to figure out what's going on in offshore wind, Spend this the is time. the place to come. Spend the time to come, right? Yeah. So if you if you're you know as the offshore wind grows, great to be over here because you can explore some of the offshore wind stuff and understand it, be able to have those conversations. But onshore wind as well as well, like you talk about robots and whatever new kind of LEP yeah. or these kind of things. Like we said this at Hamburg as well. If you're an American company, spend a couple bucks, send someone over here, or send a couple of people over here uh, to harvest some information and, and bring it back to the states uh, because it can only help. Yeah. Hey. So this week, this is kind of an odd week for us because we're both traveling. We're yep. over here in Copenhagen and Rosemary's back in Australia. So Joel and I have the podcast for this week. And we wanted to touch upon some of the articles and some of the news that's been happening mostly in Europe yep. uh, because that's where the action is. Yep. And 
Uh, let me read off a couple of good stories here. So Maersk and uh, Gusto MSC are working on a turbine installation concept for offshore wind. So Maersk Supply Company has announced that it's developed a new concept for the U.S. market that combines a new wind turbine installation vessel design with a patented load transfer system that would enable safe transfer of cargo. Uh, the new design will allow the jackup and wind turbine installation vessel to remain in operation while feeder barges and tugboats transport turbine components from the marshalling hub to the installation site, making it more than 30% more efficient than conventional jackup vessels. Uh, and so Maersk, Maersk Supply Service and Gusto MSC will start the basic design process shortly and expect to conclude it later this year. Uh, the company will believe that the concept is suitable for Europe and the U.S. and can solve some of the bottlenecks that exist in wind turbine installations. And Joel, as we've seen in the United States, we have the, obviously have the Jones Act, so there's yep. just a limitation on what we're going to be able to do in the United States. But we're seeing some of these new novel ship ideas and installation ideas happen over in Europe. Maersk and Gusto and MSC being yep. the two companies, probably the largest companies, able to do that. Well, I mean, it's only proper that we talk about Maersk being in Copenhagen, yeah. the home of Maersk HQ, right? Right. Yeah. Right. yeah that's right. Right down so, so one of the things here that uh, you'll like about getting this ready for the Jones Act, these vessels are a lot easier to build, right? So, yeah. uh, jack up barges, not not as complex. Um, also, uh, the tugboats and the, the feeder barges and stuff like that's easy right. stuff to build. Those are not crazy new designs. That's not something that we need to spend 10 years engineering to figure out how to do it, no, right? No, it's right. a barge and a tugboat. Like, we have those already. Just make them a little bit bigger and a little bit different for the barges, and we're good to go. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, the concept is great because if you think about if you are if you were, I don't know, drilling a well, because I'm going to talk about my oil and gas, right? If you're drilling a well and every time you went to go and drill and keep putting pieces of pipe in the ground, you had to take the drill and take the truck and drive back to the shop and grab one more piece of pipe and then come back or grab three pieces of pipe. Well, it would make sense that you'd have a runner truck to bring you those pieces of pipe <laughs> right. while you stayed on site, right? Yeah. And that's what this is doing, right? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's, exactly it's a runner that keeps coming and bringing you materials to, so you can just keep working and you're, you're efficient then. Um, less rest for the technicians on board <laughs> because they just go, 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 go as they're getting, getting fed parts. And as long as the weather is good and you can do ship to ship transfers fine, right? Because that's another component of this. You're going to be picking blades, picking the cell, picking equipment right. from, from one vessel to another. As long as the weather uh, envelope is good, this is going to be great for wind. It'll make it uh, much faster to install all these offshore wind farms. Yeah. And, and the, the, the odd thing I for me, watching this, it's like it just seems so obvious. Yeah, why wasn't this done in the past? <laughs> right, yeah. right. The jacket vessel is a jacket vessel. You yep. want it installing turbines. Yeah. Nothing else matters besides that. And yep. because that's your most expensive component, mm -hmm. putting the turbines in the water, that's that, That's the one that makes the money. All the other vessels don't really matter all that much. Right. They, they got to be feeders to the jacket. Well, and so if you think about why it happened that way, right? The North Sea has oh, been sure. oil and gas forever. Right. So when offshore wind went into play, they're just like, grab that oil and gas vessel that we used forever and just start using Motor it for up. this. Well, yeah. So it wasn't optimally designed to work in this kind of installation. But now that we're staring at so much offshore wind going in globally, from Taiwan to Australia to the U.S., you might as well do something. If you're going to make new vessels, you might as well make them right, just design them properly. Yeah. And so this has a, a follow-on effect of one of the things we're seeing and uh, in the United States, and when they start shipping, I've seen it overseas, is when you start loading ships up with a bunch of blades, yep. if, you, if you look out from the captain's perspective, you don't really see a lot of sea out there. You just see blades. And the, the U.S. Coast Guard is starting to be concerned about that, and <laughs> rightly so, I think. So the U.S. Coast Guard issued a Marine Safety Information Bulletin stating that it has noticed cargo vessels arriving in U.S. ports with winter and parts that limit visibility from the navigation bridge. The bulletin requires operators such as uh, of such vessels to comply with U.S. requirements for navigation bridge visibility standards or request deviation before entering U.S. waters. So if you're bringing your wind turbine blades over, you better get clearance before yes. the Coast Guard Otherwise, pulls you over. you'll be staged up out in port for a while. Yeah, you'll be hanging out for a while. Uh, the local Coast Guard captain of the port can authorize a deviation if it does not impair the vessel's safe navigation under anticipated conditions and does not violate the rules for preventing collisions at sea. Okay, so what's happening is, as you get closer to shore, the local Coast Guard is saying, all right, guys, we're going to give you a deviation. We're going to let you travel with this, but just fair warning, this yeah. isn't going to go on forever. Right. Well, so we're diving into the maritime world and some different rules here, right? Yeah. Uh, if, uh, as, a, as a follower of new technology and 
being involved in the maritime world, there's there is ghost fleets out there now. Oh yeah, sure. Right, like yeah. Ocean Infinity has the Armada fleet. These are not small vessels. No. The the Armada fleet, if I'm remember correctly, I think they're somewhere in the range of like 70 meters. And they can operate globally without a pilot. Now, <laughs> that's theoretical, right? Yeah, they can, yeah. but there are laws that state, like when you're in these waters near this port, you have to have a pilot, da da da, da. So they have a regular bridge. They look like a regular boat, right? But so we're, they're, they're starting to integrate cameras, sensors, radars, all these different things, thermal imagery, so that it makes it safer. So I would imagine that that will be a part of the waiver process in the future. You may not be able to see that well out of the bridge of this boat, but you're going to have a FLIR camera, you're going to have AI object detection, you're going to have this, 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 and this. Just like, uh, you know, the drone world, they have all these rules. If you want a waiver, you've got to put all these other safety measures in place. Yeah, sure. It'll be kind of the same thing. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So as, as these ships are approaching the United States, they have to be telling the Coast Guard, hey, guys, we just came from Spain or yeah. we just came from the UK. We made it this far. We can make it into port okay, right? Isn't, isn't that part of the discussion? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll give you an example of this kind of technology and where it might go. And so they can prove these things, right? Last night, I went for a ride in a friend's vehicle here in Copenhagen. And in the heads-up display, it had a thermal camera. Wow. That was also doing AI object detection of people and bikes on the road Whoa. in real time while we were driving. It's Tesla. Was it a test? Audi e-tron. Audi? Yeah. Oh. So, I mean, okay. I was looking at it going like, this is like futuristic. This is like something I, I didn't yeah. know this existed. I mean, I've known you can do these things, right? Sure. But I didn't know someone had integrated it into the sensor package of an actual vehicle that you can just go buy regularly, right? So there's, if it can be in an Audi e-tron, it can definitely be in a $40 million vessel. Right? Sure. We can make that happen. So I would imagine you'll start to see some more of those things come to these vessels for these protections. So how do, how do they do that in the United States? You know, one of the things that's going to happen in near us in, in Massachusetts is uh, there's some ports up in Albany, yep. which is up the Hudson River. So they're, they're going to travel wind turbine blades and I think the cells from upstate New York down the Hudson River yeah. and navigate out to where they're going to be planted on the East Coast. So don't they have that same problem? Just visibility is, With especially the if you're in the ocean, that's one thing. If you're in a narrow river, yeah. that's a much lot of harder so, to do. So I would say from my non-educated 100,000 ton pilot <laughs> certification, <laughs> right? I have a friend that we could ask about this. It's not me, but... Um, tugboats or guide yeah. boats or pilot boats to make sure that those things don't, I mean, at least when you're in a in, inland like that, you're not dealing with uh, wind pushing you off course or anything like right. that, right? right. So um, as long as the clearances are measured correctly for the bridges, uh, and maybe you have a pilot boat or something that's yeah. giving you that extra level of protection, but it'd be certainly a sight to see when you're driving across the bridge in, in New York and all of a sudden you, you see, uh, you know, 16 or 18 blades on a on a, on a vessel that are 110 meters long, right. cruising under the bridge in front of you, it's gonna stop some traffic, I can tell you that. It will. Yeah, yeah I, I wonder the same thing, was it gonna cause an accident on the bridge you know, yeah. while this yeah. stuff is traveling? Yeah, well, because the, the wind turbines only get bigger, and that's one thing about being at the, the Wind Europe this week is you just see all the wind turbine sizes are growing and growing and growing. Nobody is uh, stationary, even though Festus he keeps talking about we're gonna stop at 15 megawatts, no one at this show is talking about stopping at no. 15 megawatts. No. You, you got, you've got uh, some of the Chinese OEMs looking at 20s. Yeah. GE's looking at the 18. Like yeah. It's, it's, it's going to not stop. No. Well, so EDF is, is also a part of that bet. And so in a, in a bid to increase output, EDF is betting on wind turbines to be about 50% more powerful at the start of the next decade. Joel. 50% more powerful at the start today. of the next. So that's 22, six, 23, 24s. Six, yeah, six and a half years, you're going to have a 25 megawatt turbine. Right. So the French utility is already building the country's largest offshore farm with turbines as big as skyscrapers, which we all know. It's also planning to construct a facility of more than 32 kilometers off the coast of Normandy in 2031, which could use even large machines delivering up to 23.8 megawatts for its one gigawatt farm. So EDF is is thinking fewer turbines, bigger turbines to get to that one gigawatt number. Makes sense from an installation standpoint, right? 
Well, I, yeah, and an O and M standpoint, less less towers in the water, less to maintain, cheaper to cheaper to install. But I don't know who's making that 20, 23 point eight megawatt machine here in the next six years. Well, that's that's. I think there's there's been a lot of discussion with uh, the French president talking to China, uh, and there's a number of discussions how uh, the French and the French are encouraged the rest of the European Union to break away and be a separate entity of itself, not to be so reliant on the United States, not to say that the European Union is reliant on the United States right now in terms yeah. of when, because it's not. But it seems like the, the French are saying, hey, we should be building as we need it to be and don't let the Americans hold us back. Yeah. And, and that forges a better relationship with China, and that, which is yeah, what they've been doing. Because the U.S. won't install Chinese turbines. Yeah. I, I don't. I yeah. don't think they'll be allowed to be on the grid. No, I don't think so either. So right now, EDF is installing uh, seven and eight megawatt machines on some wind projects that are currently in construction around France and in Scottish waters, but they're looking for bigger and bigger turbines. Might have to get closer to this thing with this saxophone the, starting up behind us. Yeah. Yeah, the Polish are having a good time over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay. Uh, so uh, that's that's something we just need to watch. And as we walk around the show this week, I, I think we just pay attention what size yeah. turbine i saw some uh there's a test facility that was advertising itself and it said we are equipped to handle 25 megawatt machines yeah. <laughs> wow we might as well build them big now uh, you know, i guess so you're walking around the show talking about turbine models too one of the things i would like to say i saw the new ge vernova booth yeah it looks so so they've rebranded gev now they're you're at a trade show and it is now ge vernova so Maybe they're the next ones to build the 25 megawatt machine. But I know on their booth, they've got a TV that's about 15 feet wide. Yeah. So they're going big with at least that. <laughs> yeah, it's really the first show they have been yep, at exactly. at any level. Yep. They were not in Hamburg last year. They were not at ACP in Orlando. I assume they're going to ACP in New Orleans. I would think so. Right, so the, the Copenhagen is the beginning of their show season. Yep. It, I, I would imagine new, we see that booth in a Connex going to Louisiana. I would think that's where yeah, it's going. They, I mean, if you don't know, these trade show booths, when they're really big ones, sometimes they cost a million dollars to build. Oh, that one did. Yeah. yeah. And that's good. That tells you GE is really going to be aggressive over the next couple of months. So Norway's first offshore wind auction is now open for applications, marking a significant milestone in the country's efforts to meet its ambitious green energy targets. The auction is split into two areas, a, a southern North Sea 2 and Utsira Nord. Uh, offering a combined capacity of three gigawatts. The first phase of Southern North C2 will be awarded to a single candidate through a pre-qualification round following, followed by an auction and award by the end of this year, 2023. Meanwhile, the Etsira Nord will be awarded to three bidders based on qualitative criteria, facilitating innovation and technology development and floating offshore wind. So you know, there's a fixed bottom and there's a floating. That, that, that's kind of broken up right now. Well, where are they doing fixed bottom? Because I mean, the majority of offshore wind in Norway, I mean, it's a cliff. It is, yeah. Right. So it's, it's gonna be right on the water. edge of the cliff. Yeah. 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 Either way, I would expect Equinor to be involved in this at some level. Yes. Right, Equinor has been involved in some offshore wind. They were, they did some, what well, we, we joked about a couple of years about what being green oil. <laughs> they put some offshore wind turbines near a platform and powered the platform, yeah, right. the oil platform yeah, 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 with it. Yeah. Um, so we're not using electricity, but it's green electricity. It's green electricity. Oil. But I, yeah, I would expect Econor to be involved in that. It's it's always good to see more players entering the market. That means more opportunities for other people in the marketplace. Build turbines, more things to bid on, uh, more contracts for you know, cable A people and vessels and all the above. So it's, it's it's good to see more countries opening up. And Norway, of course, has got some cash. You know? Yeah, and, and the way Norway is doing it is different than the way that Denmark is doing it. It's different the way that's, that's happening in Scotland. It's different than what's happening in France. And it's totally different than what's happening in the United States in terms of the way they're trying to get get companies to put turbines in the water. The United yeah. States is more of a competitive system where you pay hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. Norway is sort of playing a middle ground, though, the way it sounds. It's not probably going to be as expensive to, to lease that site. I, but, would, I would say the lease is go to Norwegian companies. Though. I would say yeah. it probably is. Uh, It'll yeah. be specific. It'll yeah. be, yeah. So does it, does that change because, uh, you know, they're so close. Norway is pretty close to Denmark, and Denmark has the open system where they're just saying, you bring a project, we'll take a look at it. If it complies with the regulations, we're probably going to let you do it. Norway's taking a more top-down approach to it, much like the United States is almost. 
I think that goes in hand in hand with if you look at the past of Norway. Okay, so Norway's uh, offshore developments for oil yeah. have been driven by their government. Oh, sure. Norway yeah. is the is the richest country per capita in the world right. because of their oil reserves and how they've managed them. So they're going to take the same approach to managing their wind development because that's how that's the culturally how it's going to operate. Whereas, so it's good to be on top. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But whereas the, the I mean, the Danish culture, Scandinavian cultures are close. None of my Danish friends, please call me after this and, and don't yell at me. But, they, you know, the Danes do operate things a little bit differently uh, as a as a society. I think that where it lends more for the openness of the yeah. of the opportunity rather than. Yeah, I, I think there's I talked to some people just today about that Norway auction here in Copenhagen. And they were really interested and thought that was going to be a, a massive project to take advantage of. So there's interest in it. I wonder if there's, you know, the thing about the United States, we put a United States perspective on it. We think, well, we have an auction. We're going to get all these players to come in here. But there's other auctions happening in other parts of the world. Yep. It's not just the United States that's doing yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right? So if you have a choice between floating offshore in California or to do a project in Norway, which one are you doing? I do. I would do Norway too, because you better get, you're probably going to hire PPA prices, right? There's the ports are ready. There's no vessels. The infrastructure there's there. no vessels trouble. Right. The vessels are already here. Right. If you need a jackup, or you're not going to have a jackup for floating, but if you need a SOV or something, you just make a phone call and it comes. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. I mean, they're, like of course, they are all on, on retainers and they're on projects yeah, and yeah, stuff yeah, like yeah. that. But the res resources are here. The, the mariners, the people to operate them are here. Yeah. They're experienced. They know how to work offshore. Um, the U.S. just lacks maturity in that. Right. We just don't have the infrastructure. Yeah. So that's going to be the hard thing for the states is to compete with that. It's because Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Germany, Germany, France, France Scotland yeah. has all the infrastructure and in place. Progress is going to happen faster. If you look at some of these dates, you're talking about 2023, 2024. Yeah. Yeah. Much faster than the 2030 in the yeah. United States. German wind turbine maker Nordex is considering restarting its mothball production site in West Branch, Iowa this year. The move comes following uh, the introduction of the Inflation Reduction Act, which is expected to increase demand for wind and solar power across the United States. Uh, which, and it, it's also the U.S. is a huge market for wind at the moment. Nordic CEO Jose Luis Blanco said that the cost to restart the facility, which has had an annual production capacity of around 1.5 gigawatts, are already factored into Nordex's planned 2023 capex of $200 million. So it sounds like if things go well, that plant in Iowa is going to be opening for Nordex because Nordex really hasn't had a massive presence in the United States, but it sounds like there's enough demand that they're going to fire up the plan again. With the IRA demand, so I was I was walking the show with uh, my colleague Millie today, and I said, you know, one of the jobs I wouldn't want is I wouldn't want to be a salesperson for one of these OEMs selling turbines. <laughs> and 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 think just thinking about this now, so there's going to be so many options. You might be way down the road with a client selling your XYZ turbine to them, but what's going to take over in the U.S. shortly? is whoever can create these things the fastest is going to win. It's going to win. Right. So if you can say, I'm a million dollars megawatt and I will deliver you to them by December. And the next person says, I'm one point one million dollars a megawatt, but I'll deliver them to you in July. You're going to go July yeah. every time. So, I think so too. Nordex, is, Nordex is probably making a fantastic move here by opening a factory there to get their product in the ground because it's going to end up being who has the who has the capacity to manufacture and who can get them out the doors quick enough? Right. Yeah. So Nordex is also considering temporarily shifting some production to quote best cost countries unquote to compensate for high inflation and raw material costs. That opens the door to a lot of other countries being involved, like in Brazil. Well, and uh, it, it, there's quite a few factories right across the border from Texas as well. Yeah. There's, there's there's blade factories in Mexico that are 20 miles from within 20 miles of the border. Yeah. So that's going to change the landscape if Nordex decides to do that. If you're going to the lowest cost factory, that's not necessarily going to be the United States unless the IRA benefits, the production you, tax credits and those things. Come if you can get place. ITC funds yeah. on top of it, yeah. then we'll see. All right, so I, I want to head back to, to the United States just for this one topic. Ready. The, the blinking red lights. Okay. 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 So if, if you watch um, some American television shows that are based in 
United States. There's one in particular where they're, they're drag racing across Oklahoma and Kansas, and they're doing it in the middle of the nighttime. So anytime you see them racing those cars, you see a whole flood of red blinking lights from yep. all the wind turbines. It's, and when you watch that show, you think, God, if I lived out there, that'd be just really drive annoying. Nuts. It'd drive you nuts, yeah. right? Well, the state of Kansas is, is and the legislature there has, has been pounding some of the wind operators to, to stop the blinking lights when there's no aircraft around. And most nights, there's not an aircraft near your wind farm because the wind farms aren't near the yeah. highly populated areas. So wind farm developers in Kansas will have to, to mitigate the flashing red lights atop wind turbines under a new law signed by uh, the governor of Kansas. Senate Bill 49 requires developers to install light mitigation technology on new and existing wind farms, but only if the FAA approves. Okay, so yeah. this is the, the real kicker right yeah. here. The FAA has to approve this system. The law was proposed by the wind farm industry after uh, there were some meetings between the, 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 the wind industry and the legislature in Kansas. So the supporters of this effort uh, view it as an attempt by the industry to be good neighbors. I think that's true. I, I think it's, I, I it's think a good look too. Yeah, I think, I think it's a good look. Yeah. Right. So this, all, the, all these bills passed. The governor did sign this thing. So starting in July 1st of this year, developers, owners, and operators of a new wind farm with at least five turbines. <laughs> so if you have six or five, if you have five, you got to start looking at the system. You must apply to the FAA for approval to use a mitigation technology that complies with FAA regulations. Okay. If approved, they would have 24 months to install it. Right? So you got to get the system installed. Retrofitting of approximately 40 operational wind farms is delayed until July 1st, 2026. So it's going to give the existing operators some time to figure out how to pay for this. So the, the big, the big red flag about this red light flashing pill is that the system to uh, turn off the lights and turn them back on is a radar-based system. It tracks aircraft. They're like it's not a, a TCAS system that right. is where they're just picking up the transponders of the aircraft. I, they also have a radar with because it too. Because there is aircraft that don't have any transponders. That's right. Right. There's a lot of them that don't. The little airplanes tend not to. Right. The yeah. bigger airplanes do. All right. So the cost and uh, of installing the systems on the developer, owner, or operator, and the system costs around roughly two million dollars. What? Two million dollars to install and another hundred grand in annual costs to keep it upright because the FAA is going to FAA is going to require you to verify it's working. So how are you going to do that? So you're talking about two point one million dollars in year one, another hundred thousand, another hundred thousand, another hundred thousand, right? So do you? So <laughs> here's the thing: if if there are three or four wind farms close to one another, do they all go in for one system? I, I think they you do You figure too. out how much that thing can cover and you try to, you try to share maximize. the cost. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, absolutely. You try to get the biggest radar system you can buy yeah. for the money. I mean, that's that's just, I mean, I'm all for the good neighbor idea. Yeah, it's a good I, I've seen the red lights now driving down I-35 at night. I'm like, oh, that's kind of neat. Look, look at all the turbines out there. But if I live there, no way. No I would way, not right. want those, yeah. right? So uh, I understand the, the plight of the, the landowners in the area. Two million dollars to retrofit plus the hundred grand every year. Like that's a little bit of a hard pill to swallow. If it was for if the new law came into place and said, hey, newly developed wind farms, you must implement this. Well, then someone can put it into their CapEx model right. when they're developing the wind farm. And I'm, that's a little bit of easier to, to, to deal with. But being forced to spend two million dollars retrofit something that is a nicety. <laughs> right. Because that, that's what it, it is. At it the end of the day, a nicety, it's a yeah. nicety. It's not nothing. It's not something that is helping environmental wildlife. It's not really no. no it's just no, no, it's no. just making it less intrusive to the eyeball at night, I guess. Yeah. Well, if I had a farm out there and that red light was blinking into my bedroom every night, I'd be a little upset about yeah. it, and then I would ask the guys to turn off the lights. Yeah. When there's nothing around, I think that I think that makes sense. The question is. How far does this propagate? Now, now that Kansas is the middle of wind country, yep. right? So it's going to propagate to Oklahoma, yep. I think. Iowa. Iowa, Nebraska. Yeah. There's not a lot of wind terms in Nebraska. South Dakota. Illinois, which, Minnesota. Which is already talking about it, right? Yeah. It also, it, it'll start to click, click, yeah. click around the Midwest. Yeah, tech, West Texas, though. There's nobody West out there. West Texas, there. no one out there. Anyway, you go, well, yeah. that's possible. Well, so here's, here's the, the thing. If they start mandating these systems i i it's a lot of money two million dollars for a site that has 
five turbines. I don't know what site has five turbines in the middle of the United States. There's, there's not many of them. But if I had 20 turbines, two million bucks to me is five, a lot. Five, five million or two million dollars for five turbines. Say you had five GE one fives. Right. Those are one and a half million each to install. So you're you're not making that much revenue. Seven and a half million dollars in cost to install the wind Just farm. Just install it, yeah. And it's going to be two mi two million to turn the lights on and off. Right. That's ridiculous. Right. There's got to be a better way, right? Yeah, it has to be. Well, you know, you could hire for two million dollars. You could hire <laughs> ten people to sit there with a light switch and turn them on and off when they see a plane go by. I don't know if the FAA would approve that. No, it would not be FAA approved. But I, I'd but, find you'd have a difficult time getting it through the FAA process. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got these 10, 10 kids out there. Yeah, it's a high school with project. With a switch. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. But, you know, uh, it, it is one of those problems that needs to be solved. Yeah. The question is, can the cost come down a little bit? And does it need the $100,000 reinspection every year? Because all, all those wind turbines are marked, right? They're all maps. And, and if you have any sort of electronic display in your aircraft, and most Which, I mean, even new like aircraft my do. My brother has a Piper Cub, and it's on an iPad. Yeah. So he's got it. Right. So they'll it shows you where yeah. those turbines are. It tells you not to fly around. I mean, it isn't like we're flying in the dark. So I'll give you a, so I'll give you a cheaper solution than $2 million. <laughs> wind Power Lab, a few years ago, did a project with the uh, University of Aarhus. Oh, OK. Yeah, and yeah. it was that we called it the Bika Project. B-I-C-A, Bird Collision and Avoidance. Okay. So it was part of a project to find a, a certain species of goose, geese, in northern Germany that were endangered. And okay. we, they wanted to um, curtail the wind turbines when those geese were out. Yeah. So we took two, or not we, the project, took two Furuno radars off of a boat. Oh, sure. Re yeah. Recreational yeah. ones. Right, They're, going to spin around. You see yeah, on boats one all the meter time. and they spin this way. So we took two of them. We put one this way, uh, horizontal, and then one vertical. What that did was create a dome of radar coverage. Sure. Right? So we created a dome of radar coverage, and then Wind Power Lab ran AI algorithms to on the output of the radar to find the birds. Okay. It's the same thing, isn't it? It is, but it's not FAA approved. <laughs> Yeah. But if the FAA wants to come and knock and we'll, we'll do a project for them, just bring your two million bucks to us. Yeah, because your you're worst case nightmare, you're the FAA, you have nothing to lose to keep those lights going, right? Yeah. It, there's lights on antenna towers, there's lights on buildings, there's lights in all kinds of places. There's lights everywhere, right? From the FAA's perspective, there's just there's more red lights out there. But the way I look at it, like, um, okay, so just general aviation law, 500 foot is your floor, right? Pretty much, yeah. Is there many turbines out there right now that are 500 foot tall? Six? Oh, there's some big ones out in those five megawatt machines, six megawatt machines? Yeah, I suppose 500 feet is 160 meters. Right. Yeah, there's easily tall, tall or so tall. Right. Yeah. But, uh, you, no, you should be flying that low. No one should be flying that low. <laughs> <laughs> That's another thing, too. You could actually raise the, the minimum. The floor. Yeah. Raise the floor. It's maybe the easier solution, yeah. but that hasn't happened, right? Because. My guess is crop dusters and other yeah. other aircraft that need to get into those areas yeah. still want to operate in. I mean, you'd be surprised in Kansas how many little airstrips there are, and they're everywhere. When I was when I was working oil and gas I, in Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, I saw crop dusters fly under power lines. Yeah, all the time. Like yeah. like yeah. like it was just nothing. Like while eating a sandwich, <laughs> like not a big deal. Just I was like, whoa, I that they guy were. just flew under a power line. I hope they were not eating a sandwich. That doesn't seem like that being in compliance with FAA regulations. Yeah. So it could be wrong, yeah, that's but true. It, it doesn't feel right to me. CS Wind, a South Korean company, plans to add 850 new jobs in Pueblo, Colorado, which is a nice place if you haven't been yep. to Pueblo, yep. Yep. Uh, to their turbine tower factory by expanding their existing factory to 1.58 million square feet. And wow. it, right now it's about 900,000 square feet. So about 600,000 more square feet. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a big improvement. The factory is currently the largest turbine tower factory in the world, and it, it currently employs about 650 workers. Uh, the expansion of the facility was prompted by the Inflation Reduction Act, which includes expanded tax credits for green energy production. And with the expansion, uh, they're adding a bunch of new jobs, and it's pouring a, a, a several hundred million into the local economy. So this, this is, there's been a lot of work on towers, and, and they all seem to be sort of New Mexico, Colorado area, right? So the, the spiral, and, and 
the panhandle of Texas, yep. right? The, the spiral uh, towers are gonna be built in uh, the panhandle of Texas. Exactly. There's a couple others in New Mexico, right? So this one's in Pueblo. Why are, is it just because there's incentives to, to be in that part of the world to build towers or is it just more access to steel? More access to, to, to well, you need a lot of square, square feet for well, these factories too. I mean, steel, steel access, I would think Port of Houston. That's what I would think too. You like want to be right? closer to a port, right? You... Yeah. So that, that I, I, this this one I, I don't even have an armchair answer for you. Right. I don't, I don't it's, know. It's, it's so odd. I think it's great for the communities. Uh, I know New Mexico is always uh, everybody wants jobs, right? But New oh, Mexico yeah. specifically is usually looking for jobs. Right. Uh, Pueblo is uh, that Southern Colorado. Right. Like they're they're looking for some jobs. So I think it's fantastic. Um, you're close to your subject matter, right? So those towers are going out the door and they're not having to go that far down the road for a lot. Um, but yeah, I don't know if it's uh, raw materials or, or what, but. People? Taxes? People, taxes. I mean, it's gotta be Colorado taxes. is not the most tax, like, compliant state. It's not a low state. tax state, no. no. But maybe for making towers, it is. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe there's some tax incentives in Colorado for wind energy that I don't know about. Well, it's de definitely possible. Yeah, that's that's. I think that's a unique one. But we're just seeing so many more tower companies show up in that general vicinity yeah. of New Mexico, Texas, and Colorado. That's that, that's interesting development. That's going to do it for this week's Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. Thanks for listening. Please take a moment and give us a five-star rating on your podcast platform. And be sure to subscribe in the show notes below to Uptime Tech News, our weekly newsletter, as well as Rosemary's YouTube channel, Engineering with Rosie. And we'll see you here next week on the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast.